Hello, and welcome to another Beaver Game devlog. Today, I want to talk about GD extension and how you can actually make a C++ game using the Godot engine. So as a quick hook into this episode, I want to show you what it looks like inside Visual Studio. Um, and there's a reason I'm using Visual Studio and not Visual Studio Code. We'll get to that later. But here's what it actually looks like to see C++ code inside the editor. Um, what I'm going to do is I have this Beaver node. Beaver is the main character in my game. He's a protagonist of the story. And just like GD script, you're going to see this class Beaver, which extends or inherits from character body 3D. So that should look pretty similar from uh, GD script. And in the ready function, what I want to do is I'm going to change this utility functions print. This is how you print to the console and just say, this is a new message. I'll save this and we're going to hit control B to build because I want you to see how fast building really is. You can see it added the new beaver.cpp. So it's, it recognized that code changed and then it's building it and linking it. That was so fast. So that's like 10 seconds. Um, I have, so control B was a shortcut I have, I'll, I'll show you that later. And also I have a launch target here called Godot debug. So if I click this, it's going to bring me right to the editor and we're going to see that message print in the console. So we see, hello, this is a new message. That's great. Right? So here's the other amazing thing. And I'll show you this as a quick pointer here too. Um, we can put in debug here and the debug is really fantastic. It's really quick. So let's go ahead and debug this. And you'll see before the editor even completely opens, we do get this breakpoint. So I can press F10 to step over. Um, you see your local variables, everything that's inside there. And then you can press F10 again, but I'm just going to go ahead and maybe continue. And you see, we get the message. So you can debug with breakpoints. Like this is so fast and so powerful. It's just very exciting to me as a programmer. One more quick thing I'm going to show you is that inside the .vs folder, um, for this project, I have this launch configuration set up. So you can, you can pause the screen here if you want to copy this, but right now we're launching into the Godot project. If I change it out to be the actual, um, game, we can do that too, right? So I can set this as the game and then we hit play and it will launch the game directly, um, which is really cool. So now I'm launching the game right inside uh, visual studio and debug works as well. So let me just say this feature of Godot is super impressive. And I personally was blown away uh, once I started using it and realized how seamless it was to transition from writing GDScript, understanding GDScript uh, to writing C++ code. I kind of, you know, I, my background's in programming and I did the classic thing of writing an OpenGL renderer uh, in C++ and just to be completely honest, it took forever. Um, I spent literally years working on it and I learned a lot and it was a great experience at learning about the rendering pipeline and, and the back end. But the, but the idea that you could write a renderer in C++ as well as a physics engine, as well as all your game logic and audio logic and all of these different things, it's just, it, it was impossible for me personally. Uh, and not to try to sound too arrogant or anything, but it's impossible for most people. Um, most people who try to write a C++ game from scratch, in 3D at least, uh, end up failing. I know some people have succeeded in, in the 2D uh, realm. So the idea that we can write C++ code to make modern games is just so appealing to me. Um, and I really think the sky is the limit on, on what it can do. I mean, use your imagination, right? So C++ is going to be super efficient. You can do particle simulations. Um, you're going to reduce that bottleneck on your CPU. And then it just, it gives you so much more freedom um, to make really interesting games and, and do really interesting things on the CPU side of things. I want to do a quick plug for my game. I'm working on a game called A Beaver's Tale. Uh, it's up on itch right now. Um, but what I want to plug is if you if you like the game, if you've enjoyed learning about how I'm making it, uh, you can sign up for the mailing list. And I know that's really cliche and subscription lists always suck. But I, I'm not uh, abusing this list. This list is literally just to let you know um, when the game goes on Steam, you'll be able to get an email. And then it'll link you right to Steam where you can wishlist it. And that will just make it easier for you to track the game. So uh, I've done my little plug, my little blurb. Um, the link is going to be down below. It links to my a landing page on my website. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. 
So this isn't going to be a full tutorial. Um, it's probably just going to be uh, me explaining, you know, how I learned about all this and maybe some things that'll help you if you want to develop your own GD extension code. Um, if you go to, if you just Google GD extension, it's going to take you right to the Godot docs. There is an article here on what is GD extension. You can read that if you want. Uh, but I find myself always coming back to this C++ example. So right off the bat, you're going to want to go to the uh, GitHub repo. And the thing that's slightly confusing is that I think this is the GitHub. Yeah, this is the Godot CPP repo. So don't let that confuse you too much. This repo just contains the bindings. What you want to do is you want to scroll down and there is a example somewhere. Uh, let's see examples and templates. So find this template. So we're going to control click this. So what you want is to find the Godot CPP template repository. And what you can do is just follow these instructions. It is a little, little bit annoying at first because you may not have used sub modules before with GitHub. Use this as a template. You log into GitHub, GitHub and you press the use this template button. Follow these steps. You are going to want to do this sub module update init. And here's the trick. Okay, so when you get this repo downloaded, you're going to notice Godot-CPP. This is another GitHub repo. So you have a repo inside your repo. And this is a good thing because you can jump in here and using your Git command line or even GitHub desktop, I think will work maybe. Um, what you want to do is you want to switch this to the correct branch, right? So if you're developing on 4.1, switch that Godot-CPP to 4.1. Uh, if you're on 4.2, obviously switch it to 4.2. And the reason this works so well is that when you build your GD extension, nothing inside the Godot-CPP folder will change. So once you get all that done, you're going to have a project folder um, that looks something like this, right? And so basically what you're going to do, all of your actual source code goes into the source folder. And uh, let's work through, I guess, how you make a new Visual Studio folder next. So all you do is you go into Visual Studio. So you're going to want to grab Visual Studio 2022. You are going to need the C++ workload. So uh, let's see if I can find it. But basically, where is it? Installer. Yeah. So you run this installer. And the way Visual Studio works is you can update any components of your install. Uh, you can do it retroactively. So if you installed it for C Sharp or something, that's probably what I did years ago. Um, you can also do desktop development with C++, and this gives you the whole C++ workload. So what you want to do once you're in here is you're actually going to open a local folder. Don't create a new project, just open a local folder and then find this uh, folder that contains your, uh, your repo. So once you open that as a folder, you're going to see this. And of course, I showed you this earlier. But what you'll notice is that there's no uh, launch targets here at all. So what you want to do is in your folder, you're going to create a .vs folder. And all you need to do is create a launch.vs.json file. This is the only file you need to create. And once you create it, you will kind of get a project structure that forms inside Visual Studio. Uh, and even right now, my, what I might do is I'm probably going to add a configuration just because I think that makes sense. Like before I was, you know, I had, uh, I was switching back and forth by changing this path, but let's do this. This will be nice. So this is my demo. So let's do Godot game uh, and let's do Godot editor. And maybe I, so what this is here, I would did Visual Studio Code first, and that's why I had this old uh, launch, launcher here for Visual Studio Code. Um, another little sidebar, the Visual Studio Code launch.json is not the same as the Visual Studio one. Um, so that's also lots of fun. So I just created a new launch target, and let me just test these out real quick. So if we do the Godot editor, let's do this one. And this is the same as what I showed you earlier. So that's cool. That's fine. And then if we do, if I switch this to Godot game, uh, we can do that. So yeah, I mean, that works great. And you can just pause this here. Uh, if you want to copy this, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll put this in the, the uh, video description. Okay, so that's how you set up your launch target. That part's uh, fairly straightforward. The other thing I'm going to show you is, well, there's a couple things we need here. So I have in my source folder, like a bunch of folders that have more scripts in them. 
And really what you need is you kind of need a recursive thing in your scons file to be able to do that. So the default scons file out of the box is going to append your CPP path, and then it's going to set your sources using glob. Now, this will only pick up sources right in the source folder. If you use this little script here, uh, find directories, this is a recursive function. I think it's recursive. Well, no, it's not recursive. It uses OS walk, which is recursive. So if you use find directories and then do it this way, it's literally going to find all the C++ files in this source folder and build everything. Uh, so for project structure and building things in C++, I think this works a lot better. So that's one tiny modification I would make to um, your scons file. Um, once again, I will try my best to put this down below and, and make it easier for you to for you to copy. And then the final thing is how do you build this easily? Okay, so if we go tools, uh, let's look at where is it external tools. I added a scons build tool here and maybe there's a better way to do this. Uh, let me know in the comments if you know of a better way. That would be awesome. But if you add an external tool here, um, all I did is I'm calling scons and I'm setting the target to template underscore debug and debug symbols to yes. And the initial directory is just that solution directory. And of course, what, what that'll do is that'll call this scons file by default because this is the root um, of the solution directory. So once that tool is set up, you also need to set a shortcut for it. So we can go tools, options, let's look for keyboard. Yeah, so it's under keyboard shortcuts. And if you look for tools, it'll be, yeah, here you go. External command. So I think it was external command four in the list. It was. So they're in order, like in that list that they come up, it's one, two, three, four. So the scones was number four. And then you can just add control B as your global shortcut um, for that external tool. Um, it's going to be a little annoying if you use Visual Studio for other things, because I think you don't in general want to override control B, which is the normal build shortcut. Um, in this case, you know, control B is fine because it it runs scones for my project. So like I said, maybe you guys know a more intelligent way to do this, but this is a nice little workflow here. The other thing I couldn't figure out is it would be really nice if you could do a pre-launch build. So every time I go to run Godot game or Godot editor, I can, it'll just automatically pre-build using scones. I have no idea how to do that in Visual Studio. The final thing I want to show you is that you can actually build and run your GD extension code for the web. Um, I was super impressed by this. This is so cool. So you're writing C++ code that gets transpiled into WebAssembly. And then through the magic of, you know, everything under the hood, you can actually run this for the web. Um, I have everything set up right now. I'm going to show you in a second. But if we do a remote uh, launch, wherever that is. There you go. So our little uh, our little partial game here runs in the browser, um, and yeah, I'm just I'm really impressed by this whole this whole software stack is just it's just awesome. First thing you need to do is you need to find the Imscripten. That's a hard word to say. You find the Imscripten SDK, and I just downloaded the zip. Uh, you can clone it if you want, and so I have that over here under this folder. So here's your zip. And basically, there's a couple of files you'll need to run. So if you search Godot web build, exporting for the web, actually what we're looking for is compiling for the web. We actually need to run one of these, emsdk uh, activate. So the instructions are here. We're going to run emsdk.bat. What we need to do is do activate latest. So we're going to go emsdk.bat activate latest. Yeah, so we'll run that. It, I think it sets up path variables inside the command line, so that's fine. And then you just cd back into your game directory. And you can go ahead and do scones, but our platform is now web. And you can, and you can build that. Um, one quick note on building. I have shown in this video that building is super fast. This is after you do your initial build. Your initial build might take, you know, three or four minutes. It's still not that bad, but it's rebuilding that whole Godot CPP uh, library. So 
once again, the Godot CPP library doesn't change, but if you change your source files, then in here we can see beaver.cpp uh, has changed. If you wanted to release a higher fidelity game for the web, I think that's possible now, right? With this, with this pipeline that is getting C++ code, more or less into WebAssembly and running, running games on the web, you should get a lot of performance boost from that. There's one more thing I'm going to show you about the, um, the repo here. I had a whole bunch of examples up of good things to look at, but in the Godot CPP template repo, I think everything is pretty much all set up, but what you're going to notice is that in the S construct file, there is extension name here. Now this is going to be super confusing and probably going to cause you some grief right off the bat. So let's just go ahead and stop this. So what I would recommend you do first, and you can fix all this naming later, um, is you go into that scons file and just change lib name to GD example. And what this is going to do is this is going to make all of the naming within the system line up. And I think there's one more little tweak as well. So when you're in here, you're going to notice that I, the bin folder is not really set up properly. So the bin folder has these folders, Android, Linux, Mac OS, Windows. And if you go in here, you're going to notice the example.gd extension. This file here is what actually gets loaded by the editor to know what builds to use uh, inside the editor or inside the game eventually, right? So it's going to copy these DLL files to your exported game uh, or what have you. So this is not correct because it's trying to put it right in the bin folder when in reality it wants to build inside these folders. So one more tweak I had to make to get it to work. If you go into demo and then you go to bin and example.gd extension, I added the, the, the actual path name here, Mac OS, uh, Windows, Linux, Android, blah, blah, blah. That will all, that will help all of this work. And oh, I almost forgot one more thing in order to be able to build to the web, you have to make this web entry here. This .wasm file, this is a WebAssembly module basically, this gets copied to your game export when you, when you build it for the web. I'll show you that quickly. But if I go to my game here and I find my demo project, I have a builds folder, or I thought I did, yeah, build web. What you'll notice is that we get a WASM file for the main index, but we also get one for that libgd example that I'm building along with it. Okay, so that is pretty much everything I know uh, about it. I mean, you're going to run into some stuff when you actually get to coding your game. Uh, what I would suggest you do is once you have all this set up, you know, get your include set properly. You'll figure out how to, you know, what you need to include, what you don't. You know, if you're trying to do an input event key, so let's find that right here in my input override. So this is the same as GD script. I want to check if it's an event key, a mouse, a joypad button, joypad motion. What you'll find is that IntelliSense will allow you to probably type that in, right? So we use IntelliSense to see joypad button, but when you go build, it's not going to build properly. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you have your class uh, imported here with your, with your include statement. In the most general case, you're going to want to use pointers for anything that derives from node, and you're going to want to use a ref counted for anything that derives from a resource. Um, so let me try to find an example here. You'll notice I'm using pointers all over the place, but what I can show you is I'll, you'll see this, this is kind of cool. So what, I, what I'm doing here with signaling, uh, is using an internal signal to connect an area entered signal from one of my nodes. So I have this beaver area node, so I'm doing get node area 3d, and then I'm hard coding the, the path. So let's just launch the editor and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So under my beaver node, I can, this is a packed scene that contains that class. Um, I have this structure. You're going to want to ignore these errors. Whenever you try to do a get node statically, it's not going to work for the packed scene, but it will work for your, for your main scene. But relative to the beaver node, I'm going to have this beaver area 3d, right? So I can grab that beaver area 3d node using this, uh, quite simply, right? So I'll show you the header as well. Beaver area. Uh, this is a pointer. So this is the interesting thing. This is a pointer to an area 3D, right? So we're not copying that whole area 3D structure. We're just getting a pointer to its memory address. You're going to see this design pattern used a lot. 
But once we get that node, we can actually connect the signal on that node. So I'm going to connect its area entered and area exited to something internal. Now, there's another way to do this. If you go to the Godot documentation, I really recommend reading this whole thing. There's so much good stuff in here. Um, but they do have things for signals, right? Properties, and then we get to signals. So the way they use signals is they use callable. And in order to use callable, you have to expose that, uh, that method and you have to bind it to GDScript. So it would be callable from GDScript. In my case, I don't really care if these methods are bound externally to GDScript. So I can use this callable MP function that allows me to bind the area entered and exited to these specific functions from my Beaver class. Um, so you're going to see, you know, pointers and, and addresses used in that way. You're also going to see singletons a lot, right? So in my project here, I'm actually creating some singletons. Under my source directory, I do have game settings and game settings is a singleton. So I'm implementing the, um, the singleton workflow here. And the way you do that in register types, and you'll see this right from the tutorial, here's how you register classes. That part's pretty easy. But to register a singleton, you're going to want to create a private pointer to a game settings object. And it's just static on the register types class. And you're going to do a mem new uh, to allocate that static class uh, in memory. And then you do call this register singleton function. And there you go. Now you have a brand new singleton that's going to be thread safe that you can store some global stuff in and kind of do some, some coordinating. So off the top of my head, I can't think of too much more to help you with. Um, of course, when you're writing C++ code, the code is going to be a little bit more complicated than GDScript. It's just the nature of the language. But once you get past those C++ barriers, you're going to find that this code, it uses all the same functions, right? So everything that you have available to you in GDScript exists as C++ code in the engine. So really what we're doing here is we're cutting out the middleman and just running the code from the engine directly. So of course that gives you um, more uh, you know, efficiency boost and all that good stuff. What I will say is go hop over to the Godot Discord and go to the GD extension channel. There's tons of people there, myself included, who are super active, super helpful, and most of the time pretty friendly. Um, a lot of people on the Godot Discord are really passionate and they, they want to help you with your projects and they want to see what you're up to. So uh, it's just, I've had a very good experience in that Discord. So I would highly suggest that. But that's all I have for today. I hope you really enjoyed this video. I hope you want to go uh, encode your game in C++ now and do some really cool, uh, you know, particle stuff or make your game super efficient. I would love to see what you're working on. But if you liked this, please go ahead and subscribe and stay tuned for the next one. Thanks for watching.